This video is going to be a long one and uh, we're going to put it into two parts because we've got so much to cover. So if you don't want to miss it, subscribe, press the notification bell and uh, you'll automatically see it when it comes up. We've got a Zoom call today with John Craner, who's a structural engineer and he's got a lot of views. He watches Skill Builder and he contacted us to say, I've got a few things I'd like to add to your videos, flesh them out a bit, give us a bit of context and uh, a little bit of his expertise. So hello, John. How are you Hi, doing? Roger. Nice to see you. You're in Wales, I believe. Yeah, Abergavenny. A structural engineer. Let's just start by you telling me what a structural engineer does, because if you get a, you know, an extension, say, you, you know, you've been to an architect, the architects are right now we need a structural engineer. And you're thinking, hang on, I thought you, that was your job. But Come no, a structural it, engineer yeah. is somebody different. If you're having an extension built, you, you'll be contacting an architect and say, well, I want this design. But, you know, what he will look at that is, you know, what living space do you want? And for most of the time, you won't need to have a structural engineer. It would be fairly standard thing. If you're doing any changes to the existing structure, or if you have big openings, well, because a lot of people want folding doors now, don't they? they want a nice yeah. big opening out onto the... Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they can be really big openings. In fact, I, just yesterday, I put on my website about folding doors and about having to make sure that the steel beam yeah. doesn't deflect too much, that the, the doors don't open. Any changes to the structure, then you'll need a structural engineer. So what you're saying is if, if a beam deflects downwards, yeah, then it yeah. jam, jam the doors. It, it goes along that that, that sliding yeah. track. And if yeah. it even, because some of them are top hung, some mm. of them are bottom hung, yeah. whatever, but they need a track at the top. Yes. Um, and it's often you've got it like a single story extension and you've mm. got the, the the roof rafters, yes. joists, going yeah. onto that steel beam. Yeah. So if you get heavy snow, mm. which we sometimes get, <laughs> yeah, then th th that beam will deflect to so much. And, okay. and I say with the big openings you get, you know, up to five or even six metres. Yeah. See, we, we, we des when we design beams, we do it for two things. Strength, to make sure it doesn't collapse, which is yes. the handy thing. Yeah, and then true. the other thing is deflection, which is normally moving a wall inside, then you don't want any cracking to happen above or in the, in, in the ceiling, no. yeah. which will happen if it deflects too. It may still be strong enough, but if it deflects too much, a little bit it's of a called bend. aesthetic points, yeah. If that steel beam supporting you know, above the sliding door deflects too much, Mm. Yeah, you could get it jamming. I'll just mention something else that, that with bifolds, and I'm not talking about sliding now because sliding is a slightly different proposition. Yeah, yeah. With bifolds, that if you go for those really big panes and you they all fold up, obviously, and they you know they're they're pointing outwards, then mm. they are pulling on the track at the top anyway. You mm. know, whether whether it's supported on the bottom or the top, yeah. you've got that pull, and and sometimes if it's a timber structure and they've just got a bit of timber going through the top i do worry about that sometimes because i think it's it's kind of pulling it's got a bit of a cantilever effect and it's pulling out mm. at the top slightly so i i kind of always think well there's a maximum to what you can go with with those pains before you start causing those kind of problems but maybe yeah. not maybe i'm wrong but i always think the more weight you put on something the better in other words if you you, you take the weight off the top of a wall you can push it over with your hands, you know, very often it's sand and lime structure. It you can know. be restraining influence, yeah. But yeah. when you put a load on top of it, you know, you've got a roof load on top of it and you try and push that wall over, it's it's quite difficult. If you look at a chimney stack, for example, those those chimney stacks, you know, sand and lime construction, it's not stuck yeah. together. The lime isn't doing anything. You could pick those bricks off one by one. Well, the lime deteriorates over time, so you could be talking yeah. about 100-year-old chimney stacks. So, yeah, with, yeah. With the sheer mass of the thing, you know, if you're talking about six-pot chimney stack or something, the sheer mass of the thing is not going to blow over because there's so much weight in it, isn't there? You know, yeah, that's, my, yeah, that's yeah. my point. When you start dealing with lighter weight structures, you know, we see this in Florida and places like that. You know, they're basically living in timber frame buildings, which would blow away with a puff of wind, you know, so they have to do all kinds of things to try and anchor well, that building yeah. down. Well, it's, actually, it's interesting you should say that about buildings being blown away with wind. Because another thing I do a lot is steel frame. Um, yeah, of, okay. Of industrial buildings, but a lot of actually agricultural buildings, but all steel fabricators had to have CE marking on their work. And it's a fence to, to, to put in any piece of steelwork that hasn't been produced by a fabricator before 2015. A lot of agricultural buildings were not designed. The fabricators just guessed. In the heavy winter of 2010, a yeah. lot of steel-framed agricultural sheds 
yeah. collapsed in, 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 in Scotland Brilliant. because they were under-designed. So I do a lot of work for agricultural building, and they yeah. are so lightweight. I don't design it to stop it from sinking into the ground. I stop it from, from lifting it up. Blowing away. I do a lot of hay barns that are open at each side, so the wind goes oh. through. Yeah, and you yeah. get a lot of uplift on it. You size the concrete pads to stop it from <laughs> lifting yeah. up. What's interesting, actually, is looking at your videos and seeing how you get the steel beams in. Yeah. Because yeah. a simple thing for me is I just sit here, I just look at the drawings. Oh, yes, I did the calculation. Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not difficult when you've got a computer program to do it all for you. <laughs> I say you put this steel beam in this size, starting from there to there, and then the poor builder's got to do it, especially if you're forming an opening and you've got to support do the temporary support of all the stuff above so i worked for three large consulting firms before i went self-employed so i worked for overarrett you may have heard of you know sydney opera house scott wilson Kirkpatrick, and then halcro in cardiff here as a designer you need to think about how it's going to be built and actually do method specifications or statements because the design is so intricately connected with the way it's built. And I did do one design of steel beams in a big house here in Abergavenny to remove a chimney breast. Sometimes you get them, you know, half a metre thick. This was about one and a half metres thick. So you need a lot of steel beams. And I thought, hmm, this is really going to need a method specification. So you're telling the builder how to do it. I say it's yeah. not often you do that. Sure. Yeah, and it's yeah. just as well I did do it because he, he made a cock, cock of it. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and it, 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 the, uh, he didn't support it properly. And the structure above was moving and there were big cracks appearing yeah, right yeah. up in the loft. I think you hit upon something very important there because you're saying that, okay, you do the design, you know, you come up with a, you know, you, you worked out the size of the beams to put in, right, builders, now you've got to stick those beams in. There is no method statement. There's nothing there to say to the builders, this is how you go about putting this in and supporting the structure more importantly while you're putting it in and mm. that is that is a such a gray area because it's left up to mm. builders experience and there are loads of videos on youtube where it's gone badly wrong where they've been swinging in a steel beam and it's acted like a battering ram and taken really, off yeah. and away. having a bit of guidance on how you safely prop a building because you know we use strong boys and so on we want to prop yeah, on one yeah. side because getting the steel beam in is often a problem when you've got loads of acros in the way so you try to do it from one side or you try to put a steel beam at the foot of the wall before you start knocking through mm. so that you can just lift it up but you know we've tried all kinds of things and the other thing that's happening quite a lot now is that on loft conversions what we call the tin lid which is the canopy over the top oh yes yes yeah. but the big problem with a tin lid is that okay you put the tin lid on you strip the roof off now you want to get a steel in maybe you want to get a ridge beam in and you've got a tin lid in the way so that's where we end up you know in one of our videos we ended up mauling the thing in bit by bit it's interesting it's, seeing those steel beams going in how, how you kind of just move it bit by bit almost using the kind of the old egyptian method of you yeah. know rollers of, of yeah, you know pushing absolutely. it along and yeah. Yeah, tilting and rotating no, it. I see it. Yeah. I, you know, I learned a lot from uh, Stonehenge, quite honestly, you know, because I go back a bit. <laughs> Talking about loft conversions, I get asked, oh, we, we, we can't get that length of beam in. I've designed beams seven right. or eight metres long. Okay, you can transport it to site, okay, but getting it up there. Mm. So they've asked me, can we split it up into two and, and connect splice it? So them, yeah. I have a, a really good computer program on here that does joint design. You, you have a splice where you have yeah, a top and bottom plate. Yeah. For um, those who don't know what a splice is, it's basically a bit of steel plate that you put on the side of the beam. You're bolting through so that you're joining those two bits of beam. There's a flange plate at the end as well, isn't there, to bolt through? Yeah, through. that's what, yeah. So instead of having one seven meter long beam, you've got two. Three and a half meter long beams. And so what I want to just talk about very briefly, John, here is yeah. that if you've got what we used to call an RSJ, you know, a steel yes, column, a beam, you know, language, that people yeah. understand this. So you look at it from the end, it's an H section. You can drill through that beam on the center line with quite large holes before oh. it starts to compromise. I mean, do, do you know the rules for, for notching in timber joists? Yes. I think from NHBC, they say yeah. you can do so many holes at the ends. In the middle of the beam, that's where it's doing all the bending. Yeah. Therefore, you need you need the depth of, of the beam there. Yeah. But what you can do is in the middle of the beam, you can put a hole in the middle. Yeah. Because actually the, the, the stress there is zero. That's right. Yeah. It's only at the top oh. and the bottom that it's maximum. But you don't want to put holes at the ends. It's quite strong at shear at the ends, but it's yeah. the bending that's critical. So, yeah, 
Is it steel beams? Well, well, there are things called castellated beams. We're going into big things now, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Um, you look B&Q at them and you wonder where the strength you... comes from, don't you? When you... <laughs> yes. Surely, that well, the, the, the strength of a, a steel beam really comes from the top and the bottom flanges. So, okay, so we've got what we call the web, which is the upright piece, yes, if you like, and yeah, then the... across the top, and then the top bit that, that's the flange, that's right. That's so the flange, no, no, so we've got, got a flange, bit, yeah. top and bottom. Okay, so what you're saying is that the strength of a steel beam is coming from those top bit, the yeah, the, 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 the flanges, separation of the those top bits, yeah. So that's so, in the middle bit. At the ends, where you've got this shear, that's it, where you, it, need, you, the web. Need, you need the web there. Yeah, the web is okay. doing all the work. Somewhere along that beam, there's a, there's a, a change, if you like, yeah. from the end to the middle of what part of the beam is doing the work. The other thing that you get, which I, I hear a lot about, this problem of rotation when you load a beam oh well it twisting starts to twist. it starts to lateral rotate lateral torsion or buckling it's to do with a bit like I knew, I knew it would be a ruler <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if you pull this in tension yeah. you can you know I, I can't do it yeah no, no, it's fine. but if yeah. you put it in compression now and I've got it's quite okay. wide there but it's narrow there yeah and I only put a nominal load and whoops oh. it's gone Fantastic. Now that's to, that, that's basically what's called buckling. And um, that, what a perfect demonstration that yes, is. Yes, <laughs> that's good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I um, so, so when you have uh, steel beams that support walls, basically, they don't have any lateral restraints. You start because no, there's no put, joists going into the side yeah, of them. Some put like timber that. joists into them, okay. so you've got the web there, and they go into it. That stops it from twist twisting, doing this lateral torsion. But if you just got a wall on top then you've got no, nothing to stop it. So, yeah, the, the design then t- has to, to um, look at this twisting and buckling. And, and, and yeah, because the, the, the maximum strength in the beam is reduced. So when we, we talk, we've been talking about steel beams mostly, but when you're talking about timber, you've got exactly the same sort of things going on. You've got a timber a piece of a joist going through, and in the middle you've got this tendency for it to want to deflect mm. you know, different plane if you like that's the buckling and yeah. therefore that's where you need to put your noggins in yeah your herringbone struts yeah oh herringbone struts well, well, used to be yes Stan Cox did a demonstration for us on putting in herringbone struts and of course people went oh you're wasting your time just use solid blocking you know but actually it's the herringbone awesome. strut is a yeah. way better thing than yeah, a solid yeah. block isn't it solid block shrinks slightly it, it just doesn't transfer the load because it's reliant on a fixing if you like a screw or a nail through it 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 doesn't transfer the load in the same way that a herringbone strut do you ever use uh, the, the the metal equivalent of, of yeah, the yeah, yeah 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 the simpson strong tie ones or tico do them uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that kind of thing i don't know about those i'll tell you what i did do once actually funnily enough i used a load of metal banding you know the stuff well, with the whole holes yeah. in and I did that up and down, under, up, under and over, yeah. and I tensioned it. I tensioned it with this kind of bar at the end. Yeah, that's important, yeah. Really yeah. tight, and then fixed it with screws. Went back a few days later, it was as loose as a goose. The whole oh, thing no. was baggy. And I think what had happened is the banding well, temperature changed. stretched. I think it just stretched. It's I think stretch, it, right. it, it's a bit of rubbish. Yeah. It's not the steel's not great, is it? It's full of holes. So it was a complete waste of time. So I never did that again, but it was... Um, I thought it was a good idea. I've seen it done in other places, but I'm yeah. guessing they use something better than than that banding strip. So when you do that herringbone all the way through, say the middle of the joist, if you like, mid-span all the way through, when you get to the ends, the last joist, when it's 50 millimetres from the yeah. wall, you then need to put a block in between the last joist and the brick wall or block wall, whatever it is. And, and then perhaps even strap it to the wall because you yeah. you really want something solid. Otherwise, everything is just going to go over That's like it, exactly uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So, which is, so you, I mean, then another thing we come to about bracing is mainly in, in truss rafter roofs. Tell us what your views on cracking and cracks and, and what we said about them, if you like. One thing I think that is critical, actually, that you brought up is that the strength of the mortar that should never be stronger than the brickwork because people are oh, going to make this really stiff. It's going to make a good wall. And because most of the cracking I see in buildings, because I do a lot of surveys of, 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 of yeah. houses, you know, yeah. and I very rarely see cracking due to subsidence. I'm, I'm in an area where we don't have... I was going to say, you're, you're building on rock there, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> well, <laughs> no. <laughs> what is it then? Tell well, me actually, what it is. Well, I, I used to get a, a fair bit of mining subsidence because I'm oh, just on the course. edge of yeah, the yeah, South yeah, Wales yeah. Valleys. You talk about yeah. Glenavon. Yeah. I am doing an investigation of a house um, that has got subsidence. Firstly, I think I've seen in about eight or ten years. 
but that's due to water leaking from the drains. Okay, so that's the most yes. common cause. Washed it away. Of, yeah, Absolutely. Washed it away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I say, it, it's mainly where you've got a, new, a newish house and they've used too strong a mortar with the expansion and contraction. Of, and you get large panels without movement joints. Mm. Now, movement joints is another thing we can talk about. You need that. A lot of buildings don't have them. During the day, you can expect, you know, you get lots of temperature changes in just one day. The worst thing is, let's like, say, like April, and it can get really hot, and then it can get go freezing at night. Absolutely. So what happens is, is that when it contracts at night, after being very hot, then the wall goes into um, tension. Yeah. The okay. masonry is fine in compression, but just yeah. a bit of tension. And, yeah. and, and you get the, the, the this cracking in it. And if you have strong water, it, it, it gets concentrated in one point when i see cracking it's mostly due to um expansion yeah. and contraction when, when when i look at movement joints i mean i just follow the drawing obviously you know yeah the, well the drawing the positions marked up and so we just do what we're told if you like when i look at them i think okay you've got a six meter wall and we need to have a movement joint in it well yeah for and, it's depending on what material for concrete yeah, block, yeah well, i'm just concrete, i'm yeah, just going to say rule of thumb you know that yeah. the, the, the architect whoever's done the drawing for me yeah has said right six meter wall we're going to put a movement joint in there we're yeah. going to put some slip ties in there if i were left to my own devices if i wasn't following that drawing i would think okay stick the movement joint in the middle of the wall because that means you're splitting the difference if you like you know you've got a, a six meter wall stick it in a three meters but they say no you stick it in a meter from the end of the wall near the corner or somewhere you know and it, it just seems i think well why there it can seem odd but you put it by openings yeah between the window sill of the first floor window and then the head of the ground floor yeah. You've got a narrow panel on each side. You've got big panels. Yeah. So there are different shrinkage kind of yeah. rates yeah. going going on there. So sometimes you put you put them there. Sometimes you put them behind um, down pipes because you can't see them. That's right. That's why I, I like think the reason to, I like to do that is, is at the corner. You, that, that's the strong point there. Mm. So you you just come a bit away from that and you use that as your start. Okay. To put them in at six meter lengths. You get cracks under windows, don't you? You've got a lintel above the window. It's coming down on both sides. Well, that yeah. bit under the win window, it's got no load on it because probably it's been too strong a mortar. Because yeah. if you have weak mortar, it will do lots of little cracking all okay. the way along the wall. Yeah, but if you have that. really strong mortar, it, it will. Well, it, it will say, "I'm not going." The, the, the masonry's got to crack <laughs> because you've got these. Um, I say a little panel between the. Um, Mm. windows and a big panel each side so you've got this different rates of shrinkage and there and it uh, when it is is also effectively a stress concentrator I, I spent a couple of very happy years i'm going to say that working with a bricklayer as a bricklayer's laborer and he was a very good old school bricklayer you know you learn a lot from them yeah he said to me one of the worst things that ever happened to the building industry cement because he said, you know, when we got that the lime, suddenly everyone's going three to one, four to one, whatever they're doing. And of course, the the problem is that we then got lightweight block work. They didn't alter the mix between the block work and the the brick work. So if I was knocking up for him and he was doing a bit of block work and a bit of brick work, he would want two different strengths of mix. The brick work, you might go for a four to one. The block work, if it's an air creep block, you might go for six to one. He didn't want to be laying lightweight air creep blocks with a, a four to one sand and cement mix, you know, no good at all. So I would have to knock up according to what he needed. So a lot of people just don't bother doing that because that's a slow process. Yeah, but all the specifications had, you know, one, one, two, six, yeah. Cement, lime sand so yeah. it's always been inbred to me that yeah. you know a, a mortar mix needs to have lime in it even though it's yeah. got you know so the premium cements you know the ones which cost a little bit more money now have a plasticizer in there building like a kind of lime thing or whatever but it, it slightly weakens it so it gives it a bit more movement the problem is there that the, the cement manufacturers will say to you right so if you buy that sand so if you buy that cement there's no need for you to use a plasticizer Mm -hmm. But, of course, a lot of builders, old school, they're going, all right, okay, stick a bit of Feb mix in there or whatever, or even, dare I say, washing up liquid. <laughs> That's and, what I always hear. And then they wonder why they got salt, you know, efflorescence coming out of the mortar everywhere because washing up liquid is basically salt. You still see it. You still see it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Guys, guys doing it. So, yeah. So, Damp is the other one that I really oh, yeah, just right. want to touch yeah, upon damp this. because we love damp. You know, yes. that's a, that gets people really hot under the collar. We get well, I've, I've recently bought a book um, called The 
Oh, is that back to front, the warm, dry home? Oh, okay. It's written by our friend Peter Ward, who has got some really good advice on his videos, actually. Trouble yeah. is, he's also of the same ilk as I originally also heard about him, but bought this other book. Jeff Howe. I know Jeff Howe very Jeff well. Howell, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because they're both of the opinion that rising damp doesn't exist. And they said, oh, especially Jeff Powell, oh, I've done tests, you know, I've done a scientific thing. I, I've, I've seen him. Those I've seen his tests. I've they were scientific. And they lasted for such a short time as well. I mean, if you think, you know, the, the buildings you look at are 100 plus years old and they they left their brick columns in water for weeks. If you want to do anything, you should be leaving there for years to see what, what happened. Well, it's not only that, but the whole thing is, I know Jeff, you know, I know, know him very well indeed. And I've been to his house and uh, we, we did a television watchdog program some years ago together. When I looked at that experiment that he did, you know, down in his cellar, he set up some trays, put some water in them. And then very crudely put some bricks in there, a bit of mortar in between. It didn't, didn't make too much fuss over it. Just slapped a bit yeah. of mortar down, slapped the bricks in, and went, okay, damp rise. I'm going to leave you to rise. I'm going to come back and see how you've risen after a week. Of, well, not much going on there, is there? Six weeks later, he's saying, oh, there's no rising damp. It can't be done. It doesn't exist. Now, Jeff, was he was a bricklayer. He he did bricklaying yes, for a while, yeah. and then he went as a college lecturer doing yeah. bricklaying, teaching people to do it. Okay, he's got some experience of buildings, but I would say that he probably has hasn't been in as many buildings over those years because he's been in a college as somebody who's out on the tools for the whole of their life. Peter Wald, interestingly, is a geologist, not a builder. He comes to it a little bit late. They both get this idea, you know what, rising damp doesn't exist. Now, for a start, I, I've, I've looked at Victorian books on rising damp problems and all kinds of things and what they did to try and solve damp in buildings back in those days you know yeah. sometimes even using canvas sheets which were oiled believe it or not stretched on timber on the really? inside and then okay. painted so that they got a physical barrier between the wall yeah. and the thing so there were all kinds of bizarre things going on and of course then 1875 or something like that they introduced this law buildings had to have damp proof courses in them and that was mm. for health reasons because obviously people living in damp houses suffering from all kinds of respiratory problems we know about mold we know about all that stuff and people say oh that never used to exist back in the old days when houses breathed and we had open fires and people were all right and they got this illusion that people were running around in perfect health in those days but of course we know that's not the case we know they had tb and they had all kinds of yeah, yeah and a lot of people died very young you know you're bringing kids up in houses like that they were suffering so the, the whole thing about using damp proof courses it took a while before they really kicked in you know 1875 or whatever yeah, yeah. was when that law came in but it still took a few years before local authorities started enforcing it through the building regulations all the rest of it but we got 1920s 1930s onwards all houses had damp proof courses and i think the houses have benefited from it so to say there's no such thing as rising damp is to condemn people to victorian standards of living in other words going back to saying so what they're saying is oh well hack off all your plastic paint hack off all the sand and cement let the house breathe which basically means letting the damp come into the house and then get rid of it through ventilation and heating and so on and so when he says the warm dry house you know it's all based on that thing of okay rising damp let it happen let the damp come into the building and then get rid of it. It's not. So a damp proof course stops the damp coming in mm, to the mm. brick structure. I do a lot of surveying of um, stone barns Yeah, that have got, you know, 450 thick walls. Mm. They are barns then, but they're, but they're yeah. being surveyed because they, they be, want to get plan permission to turn them into houses. So I do a survey, Ma mainly so the, pl the local authority knows whether it, whether it's a structure that can be can be saved because some yeah, of them sure. uh, walls are so bad they have to rebuild them. And I say no, no, it's it's not a, an existing building if you rebuild the walls. But I often think, you know, well, what about you know? Because obviously stone barns have no damp proof course. Let me say that is a different beast com completely because mm. it's it's certainly pointless injecting it with any chemical injection because yeah, it's so thick. Yeah. Um, and a better uh, word for these stone walls is random rubble. I know, yeah. yeah. I know. Because it's literally just <laughs> bits of rubble yeah. thrown in the middle. We have a term um, cob. Do you hear that cob wall? Yeah, I've seen pictures. Like, you know, 
not come across them. But yeah, that, that's another interesting. Same idea. Yeah. You just you just basically mm-hmm. building something, chucking a load of rubble in the middle, and, um, yeah, and yeah. rendering up the outsides of it. Yeah, with these barn conversions, it, it, it's an old form of construction suddenly coming meeting with you know modern building standards. You know because yeah. you want to you know, have it draft proof, you know. So yeah. I always say it's a balance between heating, ventilation and insulation. We've got modern houses now, which are sealed up, airtight. Yeah, uh, yeah. And um, they're, they're well insulated, they're well heated. It, it's problems with, with, with um, damp, we, we produce, you know, just breathing, we produce. Yeah, things. yeah. And it's, actually, it's, he does talk about it, Peter Ward, in his book, actually. Yeah. He does talk about no, 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 a hot, hot balance you, you need yeah. to get. I'm yeah. going to backtrack slightly on Peter Ward. He's probably seen so many cases where people have put in damp-proof courses, injections or whatever they've done, silicone or whatever, yeah. where it hasn't made any difference, where the Customers have spent a lot of money, almost the building society's fault, because they're going, you've got to have this done by specialist people. You know, we're not going to, we've done a survey. We'll lend you money on this house if you get the damp sorted out. So yeah. all they're after is a piece of paper. And we yeah. know that, oh, yes. that very often the damp has been caused by something. I had it with this house I live in now where, you know, the, the, the surveyor came around and said, right, you've got a bit of damp. Put in, we put in a physical damp proof course over the, the other one, which was fine there was nothing wrong with it and of course it was leaking gutters that was causing the well, problem yeah, yeah. so i know what peter Ward yeah. is saying is absolutely right you look at all the the yeah. possible causes you yeah. eliminate those causes what you're left with if it's still damp may be rising damp but yeah, you still yeah. need to prove it's rising damp yeah, but, yeah. but to say it doesn't exist yeah i think it's yes, complete yes. That nonsense damp gets misdiagnosed as rising damp yeah. by too many people and mainly because mm. you've got this whole industry of so-called yeah. you know damp specialists yeah, specialist. who are just there to to peddle you know a product Absolutely. They're, they're a damp yeah. contractor yeah. basically so i would um, say that a damp proof course if you've got one in a physical one slate or bitumen or whatever it is very very rare that they would ever fail under any circumstance even if there's a little bit of movement in the house you get the odd crack in the slates, you know, the, the double lines, of course, of slates overlap. It's not going to produce yeah. damp in any meaningful way. So look for other causes. I had a situation where I was doing, doing a survey of a house and I spotted one area where mm. there was damp at the base of the wall. And I thought, hmm, this is a bit interesting. And I was looking around. I thought, I'll come back to it later. And I was looking around. And then um, I was looking upstairs and I noticed in the same position, Right at the top of the ceiling, the first floor, there was a damp patch in the corner yeah. just by the stairs. And I, thought, what? Mm. Oh, and I looked outside and said, oh, yes, this is where two roofs meet. Mm. And they you know, have a valley. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. Right. And I can't see it, but I said to them, look, th- th- this is most likely to be something wrong with the roof. And I thought what's happening is that the water is probably getting into the wall. And the trouble is you know, and they're um, these old stone walls. Yeah. So called solid, Crickling but the random rubble. And the water's coming at the bottom, they go do, 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 yeah, and then it finds its way. coming out coming out at the bottom. Mm. Uh, um so, so I was, you know, this is a that ex- classic thing where you could say, well, it's it's damp and it's at the base. So it must yeah. be rising. Yeah, yeah. Travel a long way, as yeah. we know. Yeah, I also do quite a bit of expert witness work. The one video you did, in, and it's called Crooked Builder Stole 50,000, What Happened Next? Oh, yeah. There's a chap called Raji. There's something he mentioned there that I thought, oh, God, no, that's totally wrong. He, he got ripped off yeah. at 4,000 quid for a report that he got somebody to do. He should oh, never have done that. So it'd be interesting to touch on that. We'll look at the cowboy builders and hopefully look at the cowboy customers as well because mm. we get, you know, every time we do something on cowboy builders, we get people going, what about the customers? And funnily enough... Well, you've um, done two interesting videos, one called Nine Things That Know Your Builder, another one, Nine Things That <laughs> Customers Hate About Builders. I thought, well, yeah, it's interesting because yeah, yeah. when a builder comes into the house, you know, it's a very interesting mix. You know, you suddenly push together, can you're, be quite intimately, oh, you know, you're yeah. buggering about their house. You, you've got a lot of different things going on there. Th- those mm. people are not necessarily used to employing people. In other words, they're, they're taking on a role as mm. a boss or whatever. They're not used to management in that case. They're, they're under stress because you're in their house. You know, I've gone off to do a, a job like an extension or whatever we've done. It's been a fairly extensive job. And they'd always say, oh, when it's done, we'll have a party. By the time it's done, they're so fed up with you. They just <laughs> never want to see you again. Okay. All right, John. Thanks very much for setting it up, and, and it's, it'd be lovely to have a chat with you, Roger. Yeah, we'll have we'll talk again. So, when you finish reading those books, um, by uh, well, Jeff Howe's one I've read, the, the latest Peter Ward one I haven't read. How much is that, by the way? Oh, no, well, I've, I've been it's 17, quite funny. Go, 17 quid on the back here. 
Oh, that's what, Jeff's? Yeah, 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 Jeff, Jeff Howe, that one. Is it really? Oh, that's good, you know, so, uh, yeah. I can also talk also about, um, a bit more about damp in another video, about how, how I um, survey for damp using yeah. meters. It's always a good subject, yeah. yeah I didn't yeah. realise, I, I, I'll, I'll be interested to see that book, Peter Ward. I might buy that if it's, I, I don't really want to give him any money, but I'll... Um... <laughs> I'll do it. Anyway, okay, cheers. Okay, Roger. Okay.